Hi everyone, Blender 4.1 is here. So today we're going to do the traditional video where I sit down, have a look through the new feature page and we can have a little chat about all the new features. But before we get into it, I want to let you know this video is sponsored by one of you because occasionally I'll take community focused sponsors. So today's sponsor is Lucas, otherwise known as Saving Fro, and they wanted to share their duality product. This is a collection of extremely high quality photo scanned food objects with a variety of package options available and of course compatible with Blender's asset browser. I'll talk a bit more about it later on, but for now, let's talk a bit more about what waiting for you in Blender 4.1. So settle in! Blender 4.1 is a solid release with quality of life improvements and performance enhancements all across the board. I think a lot of people are waiting for some stability improvements because Blender 4.0 had become a little bit notorious for being, uh, how should I say, unstable. I think I heard about more crashes happening with 4.0 than any of the previous versions since 2.8. And the splash screen for this version is a lovely interior visualization piece by Lynx Design. It's a lovely render and it signals some kinds of things that I want to make with Blender in the near future. And of course, Blender does also provide their own feature breakdown video, this one hosted by Jonathan Lampel from the CG Cookie team. Definitely worth giving a watch if you want some visual demonstrations of the new features as well. So first of all, baking changes. This is more for geometry nodes users. If you are making complex geometry nodes slash simulation nodes trees, you might have found it difficult how if you were going to bake the result of the simulation, you would have to do it for the entire node tree at once. And that can be quite a drag for extremely complex effects. But now you can save and load data from inside node groups so that its inputs don't have to be recomputed allowing for performant geometries without losing the procedural workflow. So this supports both still frames and animations, as well as volume objects, and they try to optimize it so it doesn't take up much size on your disk, because as we know, baking simulations can be quite a heavy process. The range of the baked frames is displayed at the top of the node there, so you can see it says baked 1 to 8 to 2, 5, 6 in this example, and it also displays as a cached line in the timeline, so you'll recognize that by a little colored line, I believe, on top of the timeline view. Finally as well, baking simulations no longer loses materials. So that's a very important thing. Simulation nodes is super useful for all kinds of like motion graphics type things. And when I've tried to do that in the past, it loses the material assignments. And that was always a bit annoying because you'd have to find a creative way to apply it after the fact. Uh, but now that's no longer a problem. Very good to hear. And again, they put such a great amount of effort into these feature web pages. You can click to read a bit more about uh, this specific node or watch a video. In this case, one narrated by Simon Thomas, who will give a lovely explanation about it. So there's an Another new node, this is the menu switch, and this allows you to incorporate enum values or enumerations. You can think about these as like categorical options. And the reason this will be useful is it will allow you to define different categories in your node trees, which will indicate a different output. So this is going to be super, super useful for building products and tools in geometry nodes, especially once those categorical values are exposed as an input. As you can see here, an example of fruit picker, and we can have different options for the fruit to be selected. So there are more geometry nodes as well, we've got the index switch, which is a bit like the menu switch, except it's just for whole number values. The Musgrave texture node was replaced by the noise texture node, which effectively can provide the same outputs anyway, depending on the values you have selected. There's also split to instances, which splits up a geometry, as it says, based on a group ID. With sort elements, you can rearrange geometry elements by changing their indices. You can rotate the rotation value by any given amount. So this is a form of transformation, but specifically for rotation values. And there's also the active camera, which you can now bring into your geo nodes trees with a specific node. Now the next is quite an important change, it's smoothing by angle. This might be a little bit of a change in maybe muscle memory, but what it does is it kind of expands how mesh smoothing is performed and accessed in Blender. So traditionally, if you right click on an object, you get a few shading options. You can shade as flat, shade smooth, or shade smooth by angle. This counts as auto smoothing, and then you could change this in the mesh properties. Now the functionality has kind of been changed into procedural and non-procedural or destructive sharpening, where you can apply the sharpening procedure through a new modifier, smooth by angle. This is technically a geometry nodes tree and you can have a look at the nodes in the geometry nodes editor if you do this. But also, as far as I understand, the right clicking mode is now a more destructive way of shading where it technically auto assigns the sharpening points around the edges. And I believe Jonathan Lampel did a good demonstration of this uh, in the video mentioned at the top of the page as well. So just to read this, the mesh auto smooth option has been replaced by a modifier node group asset. This means geometry nodes now has the ability to set edge sharpness and create split normals without the need for an original mesh with the auto smooth option. And for a few more notes on the geometry nodes, node tools are now supported in object mode. Extrude mesh node is now over six times faster. That'll be good for parametric mesh effects. The shortest edge path node can now be at least 60% faster. Face group boundaries node is now over three times faster. So a lot of optimizations in this update. Added support for black body shader node. Fill curve node now has a group ID input. Set curve normal node can now set free custom normals. New manage panel and geometry nodes modifier. Hide output attributes panel if empty. 
Edges to phase groups node can now be over seven times faster. Five more nodes now use the rotation socket. So that's quite a lot of stuff for geometry nodes, despite, as you may know recently, there was a bit of an announcement saying that development time was going to be slightly shifted away from geometry nodes to help prioritize other milestone goals for Blender. So there's been a lot of denoising news for cycles. As we can see here, instant clarity. Open image denoise is now GPU accelerated on supported hardware, thank God, making high quality denoising available at interactive rates in the 3D viewport. It's enabled automatically when using GPU rendering in the 3D viewport and for final renders. So I haven't actually tested this yet in the viewport against optics. So after I'm done with this video, I'm probably going to update my Blender, take a look and uh, see how it works for all of my new emissive lighting scenes. They also provide a couple of comparison charts here. So you can see the CPU versus a variety of GPUs. First of all, we have Windows with the RTX 3090 and Intel Arc A770. And we have the Apple M2 Ultra as well. For a few more cycles features, there's a new option to disable bump map correction. AMD GPU rendering support added for RDNA 3 generation APUs and Linux CPU rendering performance was improved by about 5% across benchmarks. More speed! Work is continuing with the real-time compositor, which is great. So the viewport compositor now supports CryptoMat, Defocus, Vector Blur, and Keying Screen, completing support for all nodes with the exception of render layer passes, other than image, alpha, and depth. A new size input to the Kuwahara node, I don't know how to pronounce that, so hopefully that was close enough, was added to allow variable sizing. Additionally, a new high precision option was added to the node in the classic mode, which produces more accurate results for high resolution and high dynamic range images. And just to show you, for those of you that don't know, the Kuwahara node, is effectively this uh, stylization smoothing node. So you can see here, very useful for painterly effects uh, with different options for sharpness and eccentricity, otherwise a kind of like um, randomization, if you like, for stroke directions. Uh, yeah, quite an interesting node. Going back to the features, a new size property was added to the pixelate node, which allows the node to be used without being surrounded by scale down and scale up nodes. And a new option was added to the performance panel to allow choosing between full or automatic precision. Automatic uses half precision for the viewport and interactive compositing, while full uses full precision for both viewport and renders. So this is to give you more control over your performance. Half precision runs faster with less memory usage, albeit with reduced precision and value ranges. So you can see a lot of things so far are also considerate of the stability of the user experience in Blender, which is always good to see. So there is much more with the compositor as well. So you get smoother results for the keying screen, a new filter type option in map UV, more accurate bokeh radius and defocus mode, matching the render engines better, improvements to in painting, improvements to bilateral blurring and bokeh blur, flip node works in local space, better scaling and rotation in the compositor, faster multipass compositing, sudden beams now produce smoother results, as a split node to replace split viewer, the double edge mask node now includes zero point, and it's up to 650 times faster, jeez. The crop node no longer flips its bounds if they're inverted, improved translations in the viewport compositor, improved anti-aliasing or aliasing in Z combine and dilate nodes, and the compositor now only executes if its results is really used or viewed. So about that, I noticed when working in a recent live experiment file that the compositor kept executing even if it wasn't enabled in the viewport that is and that was getting really annoying i was using like different workspaces so i imagined it might have been a bug if it was enabled in other places so i'm happy to hear that that's been resolved now if that's what it means so the next section is a massive one for Blender and highly demanded as well. Blender is putting a big focus onto new animation features, which is also going to make animation a lot more accessible for people that have never actually dived into it in Blender before. So key to success, Blender 4.1 introduces a new way for inserting animation keyframes for a simpler and more intuitive workflow. It's a big enough feature that they've made a dedicated video introducing you to the changes, which I definitely recommend taking a look at. But to give you a few highlights, if you press I now, instead of bringing up a menu where you get to choose the different keyframe options, it's going to automatically add keyframes based on what your settings are in your user preferences. Now, this is going to be super handy. For example, all you'll need to do now is just move an object around the screen and keep tapping I, and it will add those keyframes for you. If there are only certain points of data, for translations that you want to add automatically with I, then you're just going to change it in your settings. But if you hold down I, it will bring up a pie menu, and from there you have more finite control as well. But there are more really cool features. I'm actually going to skip ahead a couple just to speak about one I really like. So what you see is what you get. Motion paths can now be generated in screen space from the camera view, making it much easier for animators to see how arcs will look in the final piece. That's really cool. To have a proper visual representation of what the animation is doing in the space. Going back up under rigging, 
thing, we have hierarchy matters. Bone collections are now hierarchical. The collections are shown in a tree instead of a flat list, which will make it much less confusing to read, where they can be rearranged and nested via drag and drop. Again, intuitive. Visibility is determined by the bone collection itself and its ancestors. A bone collection is only visible when its parent elements are visible. Bone collections can also be soloed now. So again, this makes managing the bones of various rigs much more easier to manage. And it's also starting to make list elements like this in the interface more in line with other lists that appear in Blender. So for example, you'll notice this looks a bit more like the outliner now. That's another thing as well. These drop down arrows among the software are now more consistent. That will probably be mentioned elsewhere on the page. So select and paint. A new selection mode allows to easily switch bones without leaving the weight paint mode. It's available when you enter weight paint mode on a mesh while its armature is selected and can be accessed via the bone icon in the header or by pressing hotkey free right there. So that's another thing I've noticed because I try and keep an eye on conversations about Blender for people that are coming over from other softwares like Maya or Maya. One thing I hear is that the constant mode switching is a bit off-putting so it's nice to see some usability improvements in that regard. So the graph editor has been given some love as well. We have click and slide, adjust keys with ease with these new slide operations. So first of all you can scale from neighbor, scale the selected key segments from either their left or right neighbor key, press D to switch the reference key from one end to the other. So that's pretty cool here. You can see how it's effectively not going out of bounds in comparison to the neighbor. There's also auto lock. So add an option to automatically lock key movement to either the X or Y axis. This can be found under view auto lock axis, although it says auto lock key access there. Expose added an option to the right click menu on animated properties to view the F curve that animates it. For this to work, the object slash node has to be selected. And now more baking options, a new operator has been added to the graph editor to bake channels with options to specify a frame range for the bake, define the distance between the keys, remove keys from outside the range, define the interpolation type and to bake modifiers. And there are more features and changes to help with the animation and rigging. So we've got bake action operator in the NLA editor. We've got bone collection Python API. So that's gonna make it easier for people writing add-ons to interact with the rigging process. We've spoken about inserting keyframes, channels, visual hint for failed drivers. That's another thing. So if you're making drivers, there's uh, less annoyance with them failing because you can have fallback values as well and performance improvements to the dope sheet editor so for the five of you out there that use the video sequence editor i'm kidding uh, it's now faster than ever sporting sleek scopes and improved image filtering for a smoother editing experience i love the web page here so with the beautiful chroma vector scope the scope now preserves the aspect ratio and a skin tone line has been added all of this stuff is really for like color correction and color space nerds people doing visual effects and comp etc histogram this mode now displays labels to make it more clear when working with EXR files and drawing is done on the GPU so it's more efficient. Luma waveform. The Luma waveform has been updated to display more detail, label indicators and more efficient to compute. And for the Luma waveform separated colors, the RGB parade version is now easier on the eyes with less saturated colors and it's also faster. Audio waveform previews are now displayed by default, that's good. When I was experimenting with editing in Blender in the past I had trouble finding those to start with so I think that's a good addition. So image and movie filtering when scaling or rotating strips has been improved. There are a collection of filters of which it will try to use the most appropriate one, nearest cubic Mitchell box and bilinear. And there are a lot more generalized performance improvements. I won't read all of these out, but you can see here how different effects have all been sped up. Uh, resampling as well for the audio, that's great. Blurring, color management, image transformation, filtering improvements as mentioned as well, and some fixes. And as a reminder, Blender 4.1 is fully aligned with the VFX reference platform 2024, making it easier to integrate into studio pipelines. Again, all of these features we've just spoken about are quite VFX and comp central. So the point in putting an emphasis on stability and compatibility is to attract more uh, studio minds. Blender is already technically an industry standard now, but it's about trying to encourage more studios to get on board. So in terms of USD improvements, so universal scene description improvements, Blender can now export armatures and shape keys as USD skeletons and blend shapes. Support has been added to import scene graph instancing and point instancing, and importing USD can now be extended with Python scripts through hooks. That's interesting. That means you can technically write workflow scripts for the import process, I guess to make it more compatible with your different pipelines between different softwares, and you want to see the USD hook API for details and example code. They provide links here. And there are more USD improvements. These are kind of more technical. Channel processing, uh, all for subdivision schema, single root prim. I don't know too much about this because I haven't really had a chance to play much around with universal scene description, and I tend to work just within Blender as well, so this will probably mean more to those of you out there that are working in more complex pipelines 
pipelines. And we're getting close to the end of the feature list now. So as a reminder, the devs do a fantastic amount of work with adding all of these features to the software. I'm currently on 25 euros a month, I believe. So I encourage you to sign up as well if you are able to, if you have anything to spare, it's definitely worth it because we are spoilt when compared to the update cadence of other 3D softwares, not to throw too much shade. So even though the Blender developers often don't get around to the features that everyone requests, because there are always so many things requested for every particular update, we are still getting a lot. And if we expect more from the development team, then I think we need to be prepared to provide more support for them. Now, of course, as with every update, there are more things. I'm not going to read every single one of these out, but if you like, you can have a quick look. But just to maybe pick a couple of things out which have caught my eye. First of all, the walk mode now supports relative up and down. So I use the walk mode a lot. It's where you basically turn your camera into a first person view camera and you can fly around. I like to have mine bound to shift F because that's what I'm used to. But before the up and down arrows would be like a global position. So if you were tilted looking up, you could only move up and down and it would feel a bit weird, but now it's relative. So no matter where your camera is pointing, it's going to move up and down relative to your local rotation using the R and F keys. Python's been upgraded and there will be breaking changes. So again, that's going to mean that even though I haven't updated all of my tools for Blender 4.0, probably more of them are going to be broken, which is wonderful. But you know, that's necessary. That's just how the software moves. You can also clear your open recent menu. So you know, when you go to open a file in Blender, it shows you your recent files. You can now clear those. And also if you hover over the file name, it will show you the Blender version and the thumbnail of that file as well to help you remember what's actually contained inside of it. Same with the file browser as well. You can get more information about the version of a particular file. For Mac users, the eyedropper can now pick colors outside of Blender. Apparently you could always do this on Windows, but now it's allowed on Mac as well. If there are lists in the user interface in Blender that expand beyond the width of the window, it will now collapse into a single list as well to make it easier to read and to access the different values. And there's of course more. And if you want to get your hands on this splash screen as well, that's available to download. It's about a quarter of a gigabyte just over. I like how they try and make these available. So thank you, Links Design. Now, of course, before we close up, I want to just tell you about our community sponsor, Lucas slash Saving Fro, who's provided the duality product here. Again, I like to take Blender centric sponsors for my casual sponsorship system because I feel like they're more appropriate for you. I prefer doing this than taking the regular corporate sponsors. So Lucas has spent a lot of time providing a collection of extremely high quality food scans, which will look great for well, anything you like, but I'm imagining it a lot for like product visualization, interior design, and all different projects like that. They're also adding stuff to the product every week. So this comes in the form of new scans or performance updates. And they've done a lovely job as well of explaining the amount of time and effort that goes into this on the store page. You can take a look at some of the images here. I'll show you on the screen. It's compatible with the asset browser as well, which I love. You can see these custom thumbnails with a variety of different poly options. So you have high and low options as well, depending on kind of use cases you want to bring these into your scene for. It's also worth noting as well that on the store page for Duality, Lucas has also noted that they've set this up to provide a certain percentage to the Blender Foundation. This is something that you can actually do as a product creator on Blender Market quite easily. So this is another way to support both Blender and product creators and get something back. In terms of the pricing options, there's a free asset you can download as well. So if you don't have any money and you're still interested in this, it's definitely worth checking out. You can download the pumpkin asset in both low and high quality. So they have both options there. For the $20, you just get the low poly options, which is great if you're starting out and you want to experiment with using these as demonstration objects in your scene. But then with the full version, you get both high and low poly future updates as well. And the all important Blender Ready asset library, which I feel like is quite essential for a lot of these asset based products nowadays. And as a little surprise, I have a sale for you as well. So Lucas has actually offered us a 20% discount. So the code is scan20, and I believe it expires on the 30th of June. So if you want to pick up duality and get those weekly updates, then make sure to use the code. Lucas also wanted me to let you know that they're also working on a Redshift version. So you can keep an eye on that. And also I will list their social media if you want to keep track of them as well. I think it's always great to support more Blender creators. And of course, if you're interested in becoming one of our community sponsors, you can head on over to my website, curtisold.online slash services. You can find more information there. Otherwise, remember to like and subscribe for more Blender news and CG recommendations. And if you made it to the end of this video, then put a, what should we do? A kind of party popper emoji in the comments. If you put that down in the comments, I'll see which of you made it this far because as you know I love seeing your familiar faces so yes get downloading blender have a fantastic day everyone and I will see you next time and as a final final note thank you for everyone that purchased my uh, startup file recently as well in helping to raise money for my medical consultation fees I really appreciate it it's still an ongoing problem still trying to get help for it still experimenting with different things if I have any major updates then I'll, I'll make them known but I appreciate all the help that's been given so far it's been quite difficult trying to get back into work on the mental health side of things because when you're dealing with a chronic pain thing. It's difficult to stay focused, but we're trying. Have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you next time.